I've always had the belief that in order to fight evil, you must understand it. But boy, was this hard to understand. I mean, the question dodging, the cherry picking, the just overall twisted logic. I have to warn you, this may be hard to watch. I never mentioned that there were men as dark as this. Wow, look at that nose. He's just like a pig. He's a monster. Hi. In today's episode, I'm joined by William Daniel Johnson, who is the chairman of the American Freedom Party, and Ken Daly, who is a blogger on YouTube. Is that is that correct to say, Ken? That's correct. That's not my real name, but... Uh, it's your YouTube name. Comment. Yeah. Do what? It's your YouTube name. It's my YouTube name. Yeah. It's my internet name. Yeah. Thank you guys for joining me today. Um, so we have covered various topics on our blog, um, or on Ken's blog, I should say. Um, but I wanted to go back and look at those topics again. Um, and I'm going to be bringing up these issues that we discuss uh, to one person. But like I said before, you guys can interject if you want to. Um, so I'll start with William. And my first question for William is in regard to the Pace Amendment. Now, we had discussed in a previous episode from my blog what that's about, but I'll reiterate. Um, essentially, in the 1980s, you published an amendment that you tried to push in Congress that would um, basically get everybody out of the country who wasn't white. Um, my question to you is, what do you think about that amendment now? Well, I think it was ahead of its time, but it was also at the very last of when it could possibly be achieved. I think that um, the concept is still good in that the underlying issue is to be able to have a separate white ethnostate. But I think that because of the demographic changes that has taken place in the last 30 years since I wrote that book, um, I think that um, it's impractical to achieve. And also, we have to do it in a fair manner. If it's not done fairly, it won't be palatable to anybody. So I think that the Pace Amendment, the way it was drafted 30 years ago, um, is, not, uh, is not going to fly. But the concept of having a separate white ethnostate will gain traction in the coming years. Okay. And you didn't see that or now, uh, back then or now, as offensive to people who have lived in this country their entire lives who weren't white. Uh, no, I think that uh, whenever you tell somebody that, well, I want a divorce and I want the house, I think, I think that's, that's going to cause a problem with a lot of people. Um, but I think that the alternate, uh, w which is the death of the, West, of the white race in Western civilization and the dispossession of the founding stock um, outweighs the concerns that, uh, that you know, the, I guess, the offensiveness that people would have. You have to realize that people move every five years as it is, at least. And so um, people are not as stable in one place like they are in Japan, for example, where they live in ancestral homes for generations. Okay, but what makes it okay to say that a black person or a Hispanic person or an Asian person that's lived here their entire lives, was born here, um, has less rights to stay here than a white person that may have immigrated here from Germany or Ireland, because that's essentially what the Pace Amendment would push. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, the concept is we, we want to have a separate white ethno state, and um, you you can have a place for all blacks. You can have a place for everybody. But I think that it is important to have our own country, and so. That would include the the Germans that you can't say just came over, or the or the Scandinavians, the first generations, even though they have been here for a much shorter time than the blacks or the Hispanics. But why do they have more rights to be here or in their own be in this country compared to a black person that's lived here his whole, his whole life? Is what I'm saying. Okay, because the concept of nation in my mind is different than the concept of nation in your mind. I look at nation and nationhood as a people, a homogeneous society, whereas you are coming from because of the way you were raised and the multiculturalism that has embraced um, your generation, you look upon a nation as being a geographic uh, um, area as opposed to the people who, who uh, make it up. 
any individual who lives within your geographic area is part of that nation. And I don't accept that premise. Okay. Um, well, going forward, like, how would you implement that white ethno state? What, I know it's a concept, but how would you go about implementing it? Well, I think that we are uh, so far from being able to deal with that that, I mean, the first step is it has to become um, popular among large segments of the of population, and we're not there yet. So the first step is to present it in a way and try to sell it so that it is fair uh, and people can uh, people of all racial and ethnic groups can see, oh, yeah, uh, we do, the, the whites should be able to have a right to their own country. Because the way we have it now is immigration only flows from non-white, homogeneous non-white countries to heterogeneous, uh, diverse white countries. And it causes the displacement of the founding stock of every white country. So uh, we have to be able to show that it is fair that you should be able to have a white country. And uh, that's the first step. Then the second step is where I guess the devil's in the details, how you achieve that. And I think that back when... Um, the, uh, I guess it was the Back to Africa movement was strong in the 1800s. You had 40 acres and a mule was one of the concepts that they wanted. They wanted to be compensated on their way back so that they would be able to have their own land to farm and, uh, and a mule. And so the, the concept of 40 acres and a mule is still popular among black nationalists today. Okay, but would you break up the government of the United States and create two separate countries? That would cause a lot of damage to everybody involved in that or would you push people out like how would you yeah there there is our various theories how to approach it the way the the pace amendment was drafted is you push people out um but the movement that seemed to be gaining popularity now is towards a balkanization of america and dividing it up um i think that probably a balkanization of america is uh less offensive to more people and is more palatable um so that that probably is the approach that will gain traction if indeed white nationalism is going to successfully promote uh, the concept of a white ethno state. Okay, and a couple more questions for you. Um, in terms of dating, now you've had an issue in which you've expressed before um, about whites dating non-whites and having children with non-whites. Now I understand you can marry who you want to marry, date who you want to date in your life, but what gives you the right to tell another white person who they should marry? And if you feel that you have that right, do you feel as though you have the right to enforce like a law or something to make sure that whites stay within their own? Yeah, see, so you have to realize that we live in uh, the context of America of the 21st century where individual rights are paramount. And um, it used to be rights of the group were paramount. And that's why uh, in previous centuries you had laws saying, against miscegenation, against interracial marriage, because it was deemed to be better for th that group um, to, to remain homogeneous and, and to not interracially marry. Now we say oh, each, each person has such individual rights that they should have the right to do whatever they want. And I don't um, ascribe to that views. I think that a group, a society, should police their individual members, and I think it is right and just and moral and proper to reestablish some of the anti-interracial uh, marriage laws that existed in previous eras. So if you had governmental power, you would try to push in laws basically ban interracial marriage and whatnot? Well, I, I think that um, I probably would promote that. Um, I think a lot of white nationalists would not promote that because they still think that individual rights are paramount and they would more use like social pressure to discourage interracial marriage. But yes, I think that I would think that I would think that a society that wants to preserve itself for future generations should have the right to establish laws to ban interracial marriage. Okay, and what do you do? Almost done. I'll get to you in a second, Ken. What do you believe? Uh, what you would do with somebody who is interracial but is partially white? What do you What do you draw the line there? Well, I think the concept is is that that white is really an absence of color so that you, I mean, you, there are various a, ascertainable trace and percentage tests that you could employ, but the basic concept is, is that if you are a mixed race, then I would prefer that they not marry into the white community, but they marry 
into the non-white community. You, you're just, it's all about whites and what they're doing and the blacks and Hispanics and Asians can um, do what they want. Is it because you believe that they're, that you're not concerned with what they do or because you think that they're, that whites are better? I don't believe I have the right to be able to tell other people how to run their lives. I mean, I'm not like, like George Bush. He wanted to go to all these countries to promote democracy, and he wanted to export democracy all the world. He thought that our way of life is better. We should give it to everybody else. I think that that is a wrong concept. I don't believe that I should have the ability to tell other people what to do, particularly with regard to who they marry. Unless they're white. Oh yeah, I mean other peoples, other races of people. Okay, and finally, uh, I noticed that you mentioned in a previous um, episode for Ken that you were a Christian, right? Uh, yes. Okay, so I took the liberty of looking up some quotes online for, um, from the Bible, and I'll just read them to you, and it's about judgment and race. John 7, 2, 4, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Romans 10, 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Um, John 2, 9, whoever says he is in light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Two more quotes, James, James 2.9, or James 2, 9, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And Romans 2, 11, for God shows no partiality. So basically... Uh, you can find multiple quotes in the Bible that show that God does not judge anybody based off of their based off of anything other than being human. It's no black, white, or whatever. So if God's not doing that, and you are a Christian, what gives you the right to basically make judgments about people, which include pushing people out of one country or separating races or whatnot because they have a different skin color or a different ethnicity? Um, I can embrace every quote that you said, and I think that if you followed those quotes, you'll be a better person, and I can support that. Um, religion is to help you become better, a better person and with the view of eternal life and the next life. Um, politics and religion, by necessity, are to be divided and separated out. I believe that you can respect all peoples and you can love all peoples, but still want to maintain the integrity of your own uh, race, your own heritage, your own culture, your own language, and your own, own society. I don't believe that violates Christian principles. But I think that if you are, if you, if you're afraid, if you don't know what to do, I think if you default and follow what the Bible says, you're probably going to be better than if you don't follow it. So it's okay to follow the Bible, but if it contradicts with your personal beliefs, then your beliefs are superior. Well, I think that you need to divide spiritual and religious beliefs with political action. And um, what the the Pace Amendment and the uh, the issues that you brought up about interracial marriage. Um, whereas uh, they are more of, are political in the political context. Now, religions, Christian religions have in the past have interpreted the Bible different ways. They used to ban interracial marriage. Now they allow it. And in the future, who knows what's going to happen? Um, and that's Christian churches themselves. So even Christian churches have taken divergent views on that. But my approach is a political one. The Pace Amendment was a political one. And so I don't think that they conflict. Okay. Um, my next couple of questions go to Ken, and if William wants to interject, I know Ken didn't for William, but if William wants to interject for Ken, I'm okay with that. Um, sorry for taking so long, Ken. Um, my first question to you is relative to what we discuss on your blog. Um, you have been a proponent of racial profiling, a proponent of stop and frisk, if I'm not mistaken, and you've also mentioned numerous times that blacks are more violent. Now, why do you believe those things, and why do you think that those things are okay? Okay, the second part of your question doesn't make sense. Why do I think they're okay? Yeah, why do you think that, why do you think that those uh, policies are okay? Why do you support them? Oh, I, I thought you were saying, why do I think it's okay to uh, kill people? Um, man, I, I, didn't, that. I didn't say that. I said blacks are more violent, you're in for racial profiling, and stop and frisk. I didn't say anything about killing. Okay, it's, uh, this is from the New York's NYC.gov. And as soon as I can find my Skype, I'll send it to you so you can see what I'm actually looking at. Okay, here it is. Okay. So you got the statistics, so you can you can look at what I'm looking at. All right. This actually, is from you, the New you, York City. One sec, one sec, one sec. 
can you email that to me instead because I don't want to change the screen on my Skype. So, you mind? Is it going to take longer? Uh, it'll take a couple of minutes, but, you know, I got time. I don't care. Okay. All right, so we can just, like, I'll just cut this part, and then you can just go to the stats um, when I edit it. All this will be included. It's just I don't want to have the empty space, obviously. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, well, let me just say this real quick. And according to the New York City Police Department, in 1990, there were 2,262 homicides in New York City. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's the David Dinkins era. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, statistically, the overwhelming majority of those were black both the victims and the perpetrators. In 1993, the number was 1,927. That's according to the New York City Police Department. 1998, the number of homicides dropped. Hang on a second. Let me get out my calculators. Uh, 629 divided by 2262. So that's nearly... Uh, 70, 72% drop in homicides. And the difference was stop and frisk. So if you care about black lives, uh, uh, you know, one has to take precedence over the other. If you say black lives matter and you don't care about, you say, well, but stop and frisk takes precedence. I don't think so. Because the, the theory is that uh, black people are being targeted disproportionately to other uh, other ethnic groups, particularly white people. And I, I don't know that that's not true, but I also know it's probably true that uh, men are being targeted disproportionately to women for stop and frisk, which makes perfect sense because men commit violent crimes at a much higher rate by percentage than women. So of course they're going to stop and frisk men more frequently than women. And I don't think that's sexist. I don't think that's offensive as a man. I don't get been all been out of shape. In fact, I think it'd be stupid if they did something differently. Okay. Um, so, but the point is the numbers of homicides have dropped significantly. One more number, uh, 2016 number of homicides, 330. Okay. So it's dropped from 2,262 murders in 1990 to 330 in 2016. And the only difference, the only variable that, uh, seems to apply is stop and frisk. Okay. So do we, do we, you know, we're talking, geez, almost 2,000 lives a year. Okay. Um, where does... Right, let, let me interject something, because yeah. see, what you have then is you, the end result may be that you cut down on, on crime and murder, but you, again, you're taking away the, the rights of the individual, but they're just walking down the street and they get stopped and frisked. And so I can certainly see... Raphael's and a black person's perspective, you know, I don't want to be stopped just for walking down the street. And if you are a normal, good black citizen to be stopped and frisked by a policeman just because of your race and your color, that would make you madder at society than if you're a, a, a bad black man with a, with a gun. And so that I think stopping and frisking what does make the average good black man uh, more angry with the society and the system. So I guess the, the, what you have to do is, do you want to sacrifice the, uh, uh, you know, the, which one, which one do you take? You take saving more lives or allowing the freedom of the individuals to walk down the street without being fr uh, frisked? That I think is the dilemma that you have to face. Okay. I need to pause for, pause for a second. I want to look up this link that um, Ken sent me. Because you said that, the, where do you see the black part? Um, I don't see a race stat. I'm looking at it right now. I don't see a race stat anywhere um, when it comes to the link that you sent me. Okay. Well, to get you the link stat, I'm going to have to go to my website. But I can send that to you as well. But oh. suffice it to say that 52.2% of homicides are committed by blacks nationwide. Um, and the number, uh, the percentage of people who are committing those crimes are disproportionately black as well. So we're saying, would New York City for some reason be different? And the answer is probably not. But we could, we could 
you know, get on Google and search it. You could you could find it simple enough. Oh, but I did go on Google, and that's what I wanted to uh, get on um, you about because when I first looked at the article that you sent to me about this issue, um, it only looked at numbers during Dinkins administration, which just so happened to be the only African American um, mayor that we had in New York City, and numbers after Giuliani and Michael Bloomberg. Um, and I wanted to look at all the numbers, right? So the, the Wikipedia article that you referenced, uh, referenced the article from New York Magazine. And the amount of murders in New York City was at least 1,000 uh, from 1969 on every year. And when Dinkins came into uh, power in 1990, it was on the rise in the late 80s, and I'll give you the stats, 1986, 1582, uh, 1987, 1672, 1988, 1896, 1989, 1905. It actually went, it was, it was at its peak in 1990, I'll give you that, but it did go down um, in 1991, and in 1992, and in 1993, which was at the end of his term. Uh, Giuliani takes control, goes down in 1994 by 400, goes down again, 95, 96, 97. Um, and it pretty much goes on a downward trend, uh, but it starts with Dinkins. Now, my question is, why doesn't your article reference the fact that the trend was at its peak when Dinkins came in and it started going down, um, and that, in fact, it was on an upward trend before Dinkins had come into office? Well, what we see is, is the disparity in the number of homicides is substantial. And it correlates with stop and frisk. So if you want to deny that there was a correlation, you can do that. Because I don't know how you would empirically, absolutely, positively prove that stop and frisk is the uh, is the factor. But what else would, would there be? Well, I mean, you tell well, me. Because the, the number of homicides to drop that dramatically, that substantially, correlates with stop and frisk. How else would you explain that? Well, I can explain that it probably isn't, and here, here's, here's what I did in my Google researching. Um, the New York Civil Liberties Union, which is a nonpartisan, not-for-profit organization, looked at stop and frisk between the years 2011 and 2013, right? Now, I'm not going to sit here and give you all the stats, um, but you can say that they're pretty much the same for each year. So, there were about 190,000 stops overall in the year 2013. The report says of that about 190,000, and I'll give you the actual number just so we're clear if I can pull it up because it's, okay. The number was 191,851 stops. Of those stops, um, 111,639 of them were frisks, right? So of those frisks, 95,822 of them were blacks and Latinos, and only 9,729 frisks were white. So 87.9% of all the frisks were blacks and Latinos, and only 8.9% 8 .9 were whites. And if you want to go further, roughly 64,000 uh, were black, and 31,000 were Latino. So just by the idea of you know racial profiling and whatnot, the cops probably, in your mind, saw they were doing more dangerous activities and had probable cause to uh, stop and frisk them according to your theory. But going further, it says of the blacks and Latinos who were stopped in 2013, 60.1% 60 were frisked, while 46.7% of whites who were stopped were frisked. Yet, as a weapon, a, a weapon was found in only 2.9% of blacks and Latinos frisked, as compared to a weapon being found in 5.6% of whites frisked. So to digest that, the blacks and Hispanics that year were targeted at a much higher rate. And yet, even so, whites had been found carrying weapons at nearly double the rate of both blacks and Hispanics combined. So how did, and, and overall, it didn't do much in terms of finding weapons or any crime. So my question is, how did stop and, how did stop and frisk correlate with um, the crime rate dropping based off of those stats? Well, it just did. I mean, you know, when they, they initiated stop and frisk, at the same time, simultaneously, violent crime dropped. 
But there are no, I just gave you stats to show that blacks and Hispanics are unfairly targeted, nonpartisan stats. And that just proves that you need to target blacks and Hispanics because that's what worked. I mean, what works is what works. It didn't and work. statistically, they stopped more males than females. It didn't work because they were targeted at a higher rate and they were still found to have less weapons than whites. That's a fact. And that was a fact for all three years. We can sit, I can, if you got time, I can pull up the stats from 2012 and 2011. So, I don't know what you're saying. Well, I, I'm not denying your uh, statistics. I'm just saying it's ill relative. The fact that whites may have been better armed than black people means what? Means they were better armed than black people. Well, maybe it's also the fact that the blacks knew that stopping and frisking was in place, and so they stopped, the they, they stopped carrying heat. Um, all, I know, all I know, if I was stopped and if I was frisked, I'd be bugged. And, yeah, and I, you know. Go ahead. Okay. And so I think, but what I would be, whether I think if a black man were stopped and frisked, he would be mad at society if I, and, and at the government. If I were stopped and frisked, I'd be mad at the at the police, and I'd also be mad at the situation where this this interracial situation where they're they're stopping me because they're stopping, uh, you know, because they're stopping everybody. And so um, I would think that that if you had a homogeneous society, uh, you might not do do stop and frisk. I certainly would. I would certainly support not having stop and frisk uh, in any situation. And, and just like I, I get bugged when I go through the airport, and they just have such extensive security um, coverage on me to go through security, I get bugged at the entire system that I think will just just change the system so that they don't have to uh, go through such extensive security for every passenger. Okay, so I'm Ooh, just... did you get your did you get your question answered sufficiently or not? No, not in the slightest. You basically okay, just what's, got, what's, what's missing? You're 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 I said that basically stop and frisk was proven to target blacks and Hispanics disproportionately and they were found to have less weapons in their possession than whites who were targets at a much lower rate. So how does stop and frisk correlate with the crime rate and how is it okay to implement stop and frisk if you are disproportionately talking, uh, targeting blacks and Hispanics who are more likely to be innocent than whites and, and overall the program did little to, to, to find any crime or any weapons. Okay, they're more likely to be innocent based upon the fact that they had fewer firearms. So you're saying because it was just firearms? Because you want me to read the rest of the report? Because it seems to me like you're trying to dodge the fact that they were disproportionately targeted for having guns. And it was... Well, I, I don't argue with the fact that they were disproportionately targeted. Just like men were disproportionately targeted over women. I don't argue with that. I don't argue with the fact that, uh, and I don't know that the facts are true, but I don't think the ACLU would publish, I don't think they're stupid enough to publish bogus statistics, so I'm going to uh, take it on face value that uh, white people had disproportionately, were, were armed at a disproportionately uh, rate disproportionately higher than blacks. I don't argue with those statistics. I'm just saying there's a false equivalence. So what? You know, well, so what? You know, as a result of stop and frisk, countless thousands of black lives were saved. And I find it absolutely appalling that as a black person, you would object to that. I where, mean, they're saving thousands of black lives and you're throwing a hissy fit over it. Where are, you getting, where are you getting the stat that shows that stop and frisk had a direct correlation with reduced crime? You are, where, where is that stat? Please show me that stat. The only thing that you've shown me is an article that doesn't cite race at all. Okay, what we see is this. We see stop and frisk initiated. We see violent crime decrease at the same time. Where are you getting this correlation? 
between stop and frisk. You are you're just saying, hey, because stop and frisk, then that's what that, that that's what did it. But I don't see yeah, any that's sets exactly of this. What I'm saying. But where's the correlation? I'm showing you a correlation between disproportionately targeting blacks and Hispanics and not finding any weapons and and finding more weapons in the white community, which could lead to more more crime and than, than blacks and Hispanics. And you're dodging that and saying, well, no, it still led to lower crime. Please show me the stat that shows that the crime rate dropped because of stop and frisk. Where is the article that says because of stop and frisk, crime rate dropped? Because it's been well, proven to be unconstitutional. Well, what I'm saying is the correlation is the timing. When stop and frisk was initiated, violent crime dropped significantly. Okay, well, timing That's is not... correlation. You can't... You know, it's there. You can't miss it. It's boom, right in front of you. Timing is not a scientific... Cor it's, not a, it's, not, it's not a scientific correlation. That's just... Anything could have caused it. It could have been that because... It could have been because blacks had more opportunity or more money than in, in that year than uh, and, and didn't have to turn to crime or whatever it could be a bunch of different things you're assuming that because one issue that targeted blacks disproportionately when a uh, uh, crime went crime went down then that's the reason why why couldn't it have been something if, if you want to do it that way then we can look at something that blacks had more at a certain time that was positive and that could have been the reason why crime went down but you are inferring that it, since a negative thing happened to black people that's why stopping for that that's why crime went down and i don't see that correlation because you can make a correlation of that with anything with anything you were just uh, assuming uh, well you Raph, can blame climate change i guess if you want to Raph, Raphael, go ahead um, uh, Raphael. i know that this isn't my time to ask questions but i'm just wondering would you ever have a situation where you would support stop and frisk no, because it's going to disproportionately target blacks and Hispanics, and it's going to cause more innocent people to, um, okay. who are blacks and Hispanics to... to and you're willing to it, sacrifice thousands... Where are you getting that stat, Ken? Where are you getting that stat? Wait. Where is that Raphael. stat? Don't fucking well, listen. Like, Let me listen. Like to ask, if it were applied equally to all peoples, could you envision a support for top, stop and frisk? Perhaps, but that is not that has not been that that's yeah. never happened. See, I, I come from a position, kind of a more libertarian position. I don't support stop and frisk, no matter how it's carried out. Um, I just I just don't like it. And when I think that, and, and Ken's argument may be valid that it saves lives, but I'm more interested in saving people's individual rights, and I and I and I don't really care about the consequences to the, I guess, to the criminal that gets shot. My final question for Ken is in regards... <laughs> Can we give up on that? No, no, it's not about, it's not about stopping first, it's about something else. Okay. Um, because, whatever. Um, it's about slavery and you saying it's equivalent to winning the lottery. So I did some research, um, and this is from the Gilder Lehrman, L-E-H-R-M-A-N, Institute of American History. So it's a credible institution. And they have an article that was published in 1805 called Injured Humanity, which looked at slavery um, at the time period. And there are some pictures which, when you see the final video, you'll see them being posted. So right now you can't see them. I'll give you a description with the caption. Uh, the first picture is of a white slave owner uh, basically separating two black people and the caption says the husband and wife after being told to after being sold to different purchasers violently separated probably never to, to see each other more. Another caption shows a white slave owner um, standing next to black people who are definitely slaves, one of them naked, and the caption says, when slaves are purchased by planters, they are generally marked on the breast with a red hot iron. And the final picture that I'll cover is a white slave owner telling, basically telling a black slave owner to whip a naked black slave owner. I mean, sorry, a white slave owner telling a black slave to whip another black slave that is naked. Um, the caption says, the manner of fixing the slaves on a ladder to be flogged, which is also occasionally laid flat in the ground for severe punishment. My question to you, Ken, God help me, how the fuck is that like winning the lottery? Okay, first of all, you have to put that in context. Did atrocities occur, yes or no? 
Yes, yes, they did. Nobody's denying that. Did atrocities occur in Africa when these uh, same people or their, their ancestors were owned by, were slaves owned by black people? What atrocities occurred in Africa? So you take a compilation of the atrocities and the, the uh, extensiveness of the atrocities in Africa and compare those overall to those in North America, and you say the, the difference is, is astonishing. Now, we're not saying that uh, when people adopt children that those children are never abused. Some of them are, and it's horrific. We send children to school, and sometimes, well, not sometimes, frequently, they're abused by their teachers. In fact, if you Google teachers arrested, you'll, you'll be dumbfounded of what's happening to our kids when we send them to school. But what you're doing is you're taking a few isolated instances, and you're extrapolating it across all of slavery as if that was the norm, and that's simply dishonest. That's not, that was not the norm. In that fact, in, we know that in Louisiana, there was a white riot, a riot, when they found out that a white slave owner was abusing her slaves. That was a report that I showed you from 1805, which took different um, accounts, multiple accounts of slavery at the time period. Um, yeah, and I don't understand, right. let me finish, and I don't understand how that, those experiences, which are basically a picture of what it was like to be in slavery, how that could be any worse to what was going on in Africa to the point that you could say that living in those conditions was like winning the lottery for them. Like, what, where do you get that evidence? Okay, I, I want to interject here. See, the thing that you read from, Raphael, was, was scholarship that was written in the 1800s, where scholarship today is much more advanced, and so we need to look at those great anthropologists of today who've studied this issue, Key and Peel, and they put forth um, a video on slavery that I think is more characterizes what slavery was actually like. Okay, well, being serious well, here, going back to Ken, <laughs> Because uh, I'm like, I'm not, I don't find this remotely funny. Um, <laughs> All right, I thought it was funny. Yeah. Well, the, given the context of the situation right now, like... Um, well, first of all, I'm not going to deny that what you said was true, but I do think we ought to ask ourselves, how do you know it's true? I'm not going to deny it, but I think we have a question, because the abolitionist movement throughout the, uh, you know, throughout the slave era... <clears throat> we're not above producing propaganda to uh, tug on emotions. So they would take isolated incidences and say, look, this is widespread. It's kind of like when children are adopted or when they're taken into, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I, I, so small, orphan right? but, no, um, anyhow, when children are adopted, okay, some of them are going to be abused, but you can't say well, then adoption is horrific because we have these incidents and we have photographs of these little kids being beaten. Oh, foster care. You're talking about foster care. That's what I was thinking of. Sorry. So you can't say, well, the foster care system is horrific because we've got photographs of these kids being beaten. Okay. You can't just throw away foster care. And the truth of the matter is that uh, slavery in the United States relative to slavery in Africa was more like adoption than it was like slavery. Because slaves were given homes, they were given health care. In most instances, it was illegal to beat them. Now, the atrocities that happened, we don't excuse that. But we do say that relative to the way they were treated in Africa, yeah, it was like winning the lottery. Okay. To be taken from Africa to North America. Okay, so taking your logic, we don't know what the truth is. How is it that your narrative is more true than mine when I showed you examples of what it was like from a published document in 1805 of what it was like to be a slave and you're just hypothesizing that it wasn't as bad as it was and you haven't shown me any stats. Well, you know, you can't prove a negative. So you can't prove, okay, I need to prove, give you statistics that slaves were not beaten. Well, not stats, just prove your narrative. I'm showing you examples, it's not even stats. Don't, 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 I said stats, that's not what I meant. Give me examples of what it was, of how it wasn't so bad to be a slave, and that how that was the overwhelming uh, 
part of slavery and not the over, and that this what I'm saying is not the overwhelming part because most people would agree with me and say that it was a horrific thing and it wasn't like winning the lottery you are the one that is sitting there and saying that it wasn't and expecting me not to be offended by that is ridiculous but I ask you since you are the one that is going against the grain going against the narrative Please provide me evidence of how it was overwhelmingly not a bad thing and how it overwhelmingly was like winning the lottery for people who, went, who came from Africa to the United States into slavery. Because there is no overwhelming evidence. You can't believe evidence that isn't there. You can't say, well, you can't prove that it didn't happen, so it must have happened. That's just dumb. I mean, you just can't use that kind of logic, and that's what you're doing. So you have no evidence. You have no evidence to prove that what you're saying about slavery, which is that it wasn't as bad as it was, and it was like winning the lottery. Like, you don't have any examples of, of, of that. Do I have examples of slaves not being beaten? Of that being the overwhelming majority of what slavery was for people at the time. Do you have evidence that it was the norm? We can sit here all day and I can give you, I can give you documentaries, facts from testimonies and stuff like that that can show all those things. You are the, yeah, that is an overwhelming opinion. You are the one with the dissenting view. You are the one with the dissenting view, so you're the one that has to present, the, present it being different. I, I would like to interject something serious this time. I used to travel the country with a black nationalist, and we would be speaking at various TV shows and radio shows. This was before the Internet. And he would divide up the, the, the black population into two groups, the house Negro and the field Negro. And he said that the house Negro was just treated just like... Um, really very nicely because they were in the house and the field Negro was beaten up on and, and punished. And he says that the field Negro hated the house Negro um, more than they hated the, the master. And so he would, every time he'd see an, a, a black man who was in a position of power, he'd always call him a house Negro. And he'd say that with the greatest disdain. So I think that there probably is, even within the slave community, there were disparate treatments of, of what your position was. Okay, but that doesn't... I'm asking for evidence that proves, that goes against the narrative right now, that slavery wasn't as bad as it was, that relative to Africa was like winning the lottery. What it was it like in Africa that made it so much worse over there than it was in, U in the United States? Were the slaves not forced to go okay. over to the United States. This is what both of you. At that time, the average life expectancy of a, of a, of a black sub-Saharan African was probably you know, 27 years old. For the average in a slave in America, the life expectancy is probably 57 years old. So just the length of life um, t uh, tells a, an interesting tale about who had it better. Where are the stats that show that that was the case? I, I pulled it out of my hat. Okay. So, but I think it's probably pretty true. Okay. So, Ken, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, this is, uh, this is an article. You're familiar with Henry Louis Gates, I assume. Uh, no, not necessarily, but go ahead. Okay. Time. Henry Louis Gates is a black historian, uh, probably the most reputed black historian on the planet. So I'm surprised you don't know who he is. Well, maybe I'm not surprised. Here's what he wrote. While we are all familiar with the role played by the United States and European colonial powers like Britain, France, Holland, Portugal, and Spain, there is very little discussion of the role Africans themselves played. And that role, it turns out, was a considerable one, especially for the slave trading kingdoms of Western and Central Africa. I'm going to have some trouble pronouncing these names, but uh, these include the Akan of the Kingdom of Asante, which is now Ghana, the Fon of Dahomey, uh, D-A-H-O-M-E-Y. Now, but in Dahomey, I suppose, uh, and this next word I can't pronounce, M-B-U-N-D-U -U of N-D-O-N-G-O -O is modern Angola, and the Congo of today's Congo, one spelled with a K, one with a C, among several others. The historians, now listen, the historians John Thornton and Linda Hayward of Boston University estimate that 90% of those shipped to the New World were enslaved by Africans and then sold to European traders. The sad truth is that without complex business partnerships between the African elites and European traders and commercial agents, the slave trade to the New World would have been impossible. So what we are saying effectively is this, that the, if, if were it not for black people 
in Africans, black slave traders, uh, there probably would be very few black people in the United States today. So we put the blame on them. Does that make sense? Okay. Do you want to respond to that before I go on? My question, okay, so you're saying that blacks move blacks into um, North America and against their will. And you, you, blame, you blame them, but when, when they do it, but if the whites, but what about the whites that did it? That's, that's, that's okay. Because you're saying that you didn't have the stats before, but now that you have, oh, not the stats, but like the, the, the historical accounts before, but now that you have one and it's black, then we, then we put blame on them for them being slaves. But why would you put the blame on the slaves, uh, on these people, on these black people, if they shipped them to a place that was the equivalent of winning the lottery? Because you said basically, you're basically saying it was better in North America than it was in Africa, so blacks are helping blacks out then, right? Yeah, I would say that relative to the conditions that black people, black slaves lived in Africa, sub-Saharan, well, not just slaves, but almost any black person lived in sub-Saharan Africa, well, expanded a little bit, but particularly slaves. Being sold into slavery and brought to North America was like winning the lottery. And I mean, even was, for people, villagers who were free, I think they had a much better lifestyle and in North was, America. And if it was mostly black people, like you said, then why would they get the blame? They would get the credit, right? You said the blame. Well, let's also take into consideration that, uh, you know, between the North and the South, where black people were free in most of the North, not all the North, but where they were free in the North, you know, there, there were no barbed wire fences, there were no walls. Uh, people who lived, well, for example, say you had a plantation or a farm. By the way, most, uh, most slave owners were not plantation owners. They were typically small farmers who owned maybe one or two slaves. But let's say that you own a farm or a plantation in Kentucky on the Ohio River. Now, before they dammed up the Ohio River, it was a very shallow river. Summertime, you could literally walk across the river because it was like waist deep at the, at the deepest point. I wouldn't recommend it, but you could have done it. The point is, you're a black slave living in Kentucky on the border with Indiana or Ohio. You could have got up and walked out. And that's true of throughout uh, any plantation or farm or property in which slaves were held. Uh, along the border of a state with a free uh, with a free state, any of those slaves at any time could have just got up, hopped over the fence, been in freedom. Boom, it's done. Why didn't they do that? You're dodging my original question. My original question no, I'm was addressing it specifically. I just flat nailed you. No, no, you didn't. Why did they not get up? And no, my and question, so which bad. you did not answer, my question, which you did not answer which is that you said originally going to slavery was like winning the lottery and then you went and cited an article that said that blacks were the ones that pushed people into the slave trade and basically moved them to America but you said that blacks get the blame so now you first said it was like winning the lottery for them but then when you found out that blacks were mo based on your article that blacks are the people that were sent that sent blacks from Africa to America then they got the blame for the slave trade I'm saying, wouldn't they get credit for it? And then you went off the fucking Jupiter and started talking about Ohio, which wasn't a part of my question at all. And you thought you got me. I don't understand. Okay, so get down to your core question. Uh, uh, summarize it in one sentence. My question is, why, you, if slavery was like winning the lottery and blacks were the ones, the majority of the people that moved slaves from Africa to America, why did you say that they get the blame for it and not the credit? Well, they would get both the blame and the credit. Why would they get blame if it was like winning the lottery? They helped them out. Well, they get the blame in the sense that they're the ones who did it. Help them out. So if you have a problem with slavery in North America or South America or basically any place else on earth that involved black people, you got to put the blame and the credit if you want, but you got to put the blame on black slave traders. Okay, now keep in mind that only four, I think it was like 400,000, a very tiny percentage of sub-Saharan African slaves were transported to North America. The overwhelming majority were sent elsewhere, which I'm not uh, saying that that was a good thing. So in that case, you would put blame without credit. But when they came to North America, put uh, add credit to blame, yeah, they actually helped them out. Now, they weren't, I don't think they did it intentionally, but uh, it was... Give them credit for it. I have no problem with that. Okay. Raphael, I have a four o'clock meeting. Can yeah. I say goodbye? You guys. Yeah, we're, we're, we're done here. You guys are done unless you have something else to say. You guys have anything else to add? No.
Okay. Well, I got lots to add, but you probably don't want to hear it. No, I don't. <laughs> okay. Thank I, you for doing I, this. I think it's absolutely. Thank you for Let doing me just this. summarize. I think it's absolutely appalling that a black person would be upset over saving thousands of lives in New York City. Well, I'm, I'm just appalled by that. I just can't believe it. I thought black lives mattered. But you don't care. Kill them, murder them, slaughter them. If you like this episode, check out my most recent video where I interview a woman from the organization Women Against Feminism. If you want to watch a related video, check out the video on the bottom where I interview William Daniel Johnson one-on-one. And if you like the work that I do on this channel, go ahead and subscribe.